I've just been trying to be at peace with a boring, ordinary life. Like, <laughs> if, if I can't get happy now with all of these conditions around me, like, I'm never going to be happy. There's never going to be something else that gets me in a place to find peace. It was that Naval who said, you know, if you can't be happy with a cup of coffee, you're never going to be happy on a yacht. And <laughs> I'm really focused on how can I be happy with that cup of coffee? Welcome back to the Carnage and Apricorn Show. I just chatted with Rick Forster. We talked about how to redefine success, how to redefine your identity, what that's like after stepping away from a high growth career in tech. He discusses his journey from a work-centered life to one focused on family, creativity, and fulfillment. We also talk about the value of taking a sabbatical and disconnecting to find clarity and building a diversified identity. His insights on reshaping ambition and planning for a more meaningful life are valuable for anyone feeling stuck or seeking fulfillment beyond career success. Let's dive in. Welcome to another episode of the Carnage and Apricorn Show. Today, I'm really excited to have Rick, For is it Forster, on the Rick podcast. Forster. I've been following him online for a while, and I thought it'd be good to bring him on to talk about redefining success, like redefining your identity. We have very similar paths, so I thought it would be good to just chat through some of the lessons, insights that he's learned. I've read through a lot of his content, and it definitely resonates, so I thought it'd be good to bring him on the show. So welcome, Rick. Thanks, Mike, for having me. Just to give a little cliff notes on your background, and I would summarize it as you worked in tech for about 12 years at Preview Health Win Public. And since then, you've been kind of on a journey figuring out what's next in writing. Yep. But for those who are not familiar, can you give us like maybe just like a really quick cliff notes of your career arc and what you've been up to since you left? Yep. Sounds good. Yeah. So after college, I did the very typical boring thing where I went into consulting for a few years in healthcare consulting and it was fine, but nothing very exciting. And around that time I was having, you know, I guess a quarter life crisis, we'll maybe talk about a midlife crisis. So I was hitting one of those every quarter. It really just felt an absence of meaning in my life. Like this is what adulthood is really all about is just, you know, this life. And so I was kind of in this weird space, but then stumbled upon the startup, Privia Health, that had just raised its series A round of funding. and. I uh, was lucky enough to be able to meet the founder and join the company as like the sixth employee around then. And it just captured everything in terms of who I am. I was there for 12 years where we you know, went through all the stages of a startup product market fit, going through a business pivot, uh, which, you know, was a very difficult time to the scale up phase to all the way going public in uh, 2021. I stayed on for an additional two years after that just to sort of see out the process. Uh, but then about a year ago, decided to take some time off. And that sort of brings us to the story today. Yeah, so I guess it's been, what, a little over a year since yep. you left? What have you been up to? A lot of different stuff, right? Yeah. The, the whole journey has been very weird and surprising. And I would have never projected that <laughs> it would have gone like this originally. You know, I originally, when I left Privy Health, I was in healthcare technology and uh, I was in a space that was kind of towards, you know, a little bit more the cutting edge of healthcare, if there is cutting edge in healthcare. And, you know, so I was around a lot of new business ideas and opportunities. And so when I was leaving Privia Health, I was in a really good position to just take a little bit of time off. And then I thought I was going to start a company. I always thought that was the next step based off of, you know, I would have been on this path of being an early employee of a startup turn executive and been around, you know, the founder of Privy Health and seen other successful entrepreneurs. And I said, okay, that is my next step. And so I you know, originally I took that sabbatical thinking, hey, I'm just going to take a little bit of time off, recharge, rest, and so on, and then go on that journey. And that's not what happened at all. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, now really in the early stages, I focus a lot on the business building. I know you talked about that yourself in your own sabbatical where yeah, I just have this huge spreadsheet. I've got a, over a hundred ideas on it. That's all sort of sorted based off of priority and the market opportunity. And, you know, I'd be adding notes to it over time. And I really just got into, you know, analyzing those opportunities as business ideas, you know, so what's the market, who is the customer, what's the product, what's the go-to-market strategy, you know, sometimes talking to investors in the space. And I was just, you know, I was going deep into like yeah. how to build a business. And, you know, that took me through probably the first three months. I'll pause there in terms of just digging into building a business. Before we go into like the change or I guess your mindset change, I'm kind of curious, like what projects are you working on today and yep. how are you spending your time creatively? Kind of how do you break out your week? Because I've gone through so many different iterations of that myself. I'm yep. kind of curious to see where you are today and then we could work backwards to see how you got there. Yeah, I think see the best way to describe myself right now as an, I'm an aspiring writer. I would not call myself a writer or anything like that. I'm writing, but I've really grabbed hold of writing as sort of the primary pursuit or creative thing right now, which is subject to change. But that is the new center of, you know, a lot of my quote unquote work. I spend most of my time in the mornings when I send the kids off to school, I sit down and I write typically about two hours, maybe two and a half hours of every day. And that's really the craft I'm interested in right now. That's where I get a lot of intellectual stimulation and really where I get a lot of purpose and meaning today. Yeah. So that's kind of like one, yeah. you know, and then the other two, you know, it's, Involved father, so yeah. I spend a lot of time with my kids. I pick up my daughter from daycare in the middle of the day, spend some time with them in the afternoon. My son gets home a little bit later in the day, and I coach my son's soccer team and, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. And, you know, that's like kind of my day. Honestly, the workout interspersed here and there, a walk, is pretty boring, probably on the <laughs> surface to a lot of people, but yeah. it's very, it's right for me. I always have a saying that boring is good. You know, I've just been trying to be at peace with a boring, ordinary life. Like <laughs> if, if I can't get happy now with all of these conditions around me, like I'm never going to be happy. There's never going to be something else that gets me in a place, you know, yeah. to find peace. Yeah. So can I be happy? You know, there's that. Was that Naval who said, you know, if you can't be happy with a cup of coffee, you're never going to be happy on a yacht. And I'm really <laughs> focused on how can I be happy with that cup of coffee? Yeah. Okay. I'm so curious now about how you shifted from coming up with all those business ideas to moving into this place where you're an aspiring writer and being content with the simple things in life that bring a lot of meaning and, and purpose and happiness and fulfillment. And I'm assuming there's like a huge identity shift that kind of happened along that journey. But when did that shift happen? Because I, I went through a similar journey. I swung hard into business and swung hard the other way. Probably going to land yep. somewhere in the middle, but very curious about what shifted for you. Yeah, I mean, it's a long, grueling story, to be honest. You know, it all starts sort of back when I was working where my identity was almost entirely centered around my work. I mean, it was really, obviously I worked hard, but then I thought about work after my plans, my ambitions were all about work. It's just really the axis by which my whole world revolves. And, you know, that was really true for me for a long time. And then when I took time off from work, just through a sabbatical, it really left this hole. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, before I could sort of say, hey, I'm so-and-so, you know, senior vice president of like Privy Health or whatever, 
and you know, I was early employee, and all this stuff. And then now it's sort of, it kind of shifted into, well, I'm building stuff, but it really, I didn't have that anchor to describe who I was as a person. And then as I just sort of started to peel back the layers, I just came to this question of who am I if I'm not working? And sure. that, you know, before we get into the ascent, into the new thing I'm going, it, there was a significant descent from what I was doing before. And those first few months after I was left work were really focused on building this business. But I just hit this point of thinking like, what am I doing here? Like, why, why am I thinking that building a business is the thing that I really need to do? It had been just a given for so long that I was on this path and the next step was to start a business. I didn't even think about it. It was like a habit. And then I just started to question, why do I really need to start a business? Do I really want that? Or is that someone else's want coming into me? So that was really the start was the descent of it all. Yeah. I think I read something that you wrote about just setting the bar higher. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, yep. I start off as intern, then I became a manager, then I became VP, then, you know, what's next? It's like, okay, I haven't started a company. So let me right. like notch that as like the next thing to go after. I think what? it's just natural for people to ratchet up their ambition, right? That they yeah. really know enough. And you probably met a lot of successful people who've done amazing things in your career. And, and there's always just another next level of things. So, yeah. hey, I was SVP of a $2 billion company. Well, what do you do after that? You become a C-suite at a bigger company or, you know, instead of, I wasn't a founder before, so now I got to become a founder. Yeah, you know, and it's just always founder, the next thing. And then you're like, okay, I could become a repeat founder. And then, I <laughs> you know, yeah, you don't want to be one and done, right? You want to yeah. be, you want to prove that you're a serious entrepreneur and, or build a bigger company or a different company, or, you know. Okay. So after you stepped away, you went down that path of a bunch of business ideas, meeting with VCs, et cetera. What was the biggest shift in how you viewed your identity and how did that compare to when you were working? Like, what was that like? Yeah, I think the biggest thing was just disappearing for me. I should have done this from the start where, you know, just to create some distance and space, like going on vacation or leaving the country where you really create some space with what you were doing before. I did this midway through my sabbatical. I just started to, you know, after building some ideas, I said, you know, hey, I need to disappear from my network, from structure, just clear the decks on all obligations I have outside of my family and really kind of go down to the bottom. I think, you know, one other way you can put about this, I haven't written about this yet, but is I've been thinking about this idea of zero based identity budgeting, which is, you know, you know, like zero yeah. based budgeting in companies, which I don't okay. know if I recommend. So zero based budgeting, you basically like say, Hey, you know, for people who don't know, right. You start everything from scratch. You, you know, over time organizations develop this crud and, you know, things that get built up and then it really just becomes next year's budget is last year's budget plus some more, yeah. right? And zero-based budgeting is going back to the beginning. And I think that for a sabbatical, that was the opportunity for me. It was sort of a zero-based identity budgeting where I just go back to the core, right? And it, for me, it started a lot with my family. It started with, you know, my health, getting my health back in order. And really just trying to grasp onto like, what are the things that make me human, you know, which was sometimes some of these cre creative projects I grabbed on. And so that was really the, you know, I say, you know, you have to scale down after scaling up really to return to those base level of who you are before you, you know, pick up a new project again. So you went on a sabbatical, you completely went off the grid. I guess you did this zero based identity. And then I guess you merged out of that with like the reimagining of what 
your life or your identity could look like. Yep. I know you wrote about like identity portfolio. Can yep. you explain what that means? And was that kind of tied to this period? Yeah, I think that the concept of a portfolio of diverse identities, we all understand the purpose of diversification when it comes to our money. And we would never put all of our money in one stock and just hope for the best. Now, some people in like crypto might, but it's generally not a good strategy, right? It leaves you very fragile and susceptible to disruption. And through my own process, I learned the benefits of diversification from an identity perspective. Whereas maybe I placed most of my chips on work before, you know, started to experiment with these other opportunities to diversify the portfolio. So like really becoming much more involved as a father, you know, spending a lot more time with my kids. I, I was a father before, but for example, I had trouble being present with my kids when they were sitting in front of me in the playroom. So really trying to focus on that. We took health, spending more time, just becoming a healthy person. And then finding those creative pursuits, which for me, how it all started is a mentor at the time really recommended that I just start writing or journaling. It yeah. started as journaling every day. <laughs> and I would just start the day, open up a Google Doc, just a blank Google Doc. Maybe I had an idea about where I was going to start. But then I just really went from there and I just started you know, there's an exercise called morning pages, which mm -hmm. I actually learned about later where you just kind of, you have to sit down and you have to fill out, I think three pages, just whether it's good or bad. And that's really where I started is just getting stuff out of my head. And it started as, you know, what am I going through? What am I feeling? Like, how can I find the answer to this problem? Some of it was lessons learned from my time at Pretty Health and building my career and yeah i mean there i just have mounds of google documents now that i haven't published or shared and probably should never be shared but it's just i started that practice over time and you know fast forward a little bit later is when i decided hey maybe there's something here to share with the world like this is not just a journal but something that can be shared outside of just me and my own head at the time cut it do you think you could have done that reflection without going off the grid or disappearing? Do you think disappearing and like cutting out the noise allowed you to connect with what you're really seeking at that time? That's such a good question. Yeah. I'd be curious your thoughts too. Yeah. I really don't think for myself, I could have done it without a big disconnect. It's very hard, especially just what I was saying about my identity being so enmeshed in my work and the demands around work are endless and the opportunities are endless. And I couldn't stop myself, to be honest. <laughs> you know, right, but when I was saying I took time off and I went right back to work, right? I couldn't stop myself. And so I kind of needed to have a cold turkey period just to, maybe it's an addiction. And I really needed a strong disconnect for me to kind of reestablish my relationship to work to say, hey, like that old me, that is not a sustainable, high quality life. And so how do I start over? But I would really love to find ways that could be done without a full sabbatical in order to make it more accessible for other people. But for me, I think it was very necessary. What about for you? I would say it was pretty necessary for me as well. What I wish I would have done, it was gone cold turkey a lot sooner. I didn't yeah. realize that just being surrounded by people that are working there or following them on Twitter or reading their newsletter or texting with people that were still like thinking through ideas. If it was like a, like a drug, I just kept relapsing. So then yeah. I would go down this other rabbit hole around this other idea. What I found is like, I would just go down these rabbit holes and then I, I would get less excited and I would just do that over and over again. And then one day I was like, I just need to like, just break away from this completely, like a hundred percent. But I don't think I could have done that without 
taking a full step back. The other thing about spat, I, I think it would be very hard for someone to do that while they're working. Because so I've talked to a yes. lot of people that are currently working either as like a founder or working at a company and they know they need to make a transition, but for whatever reason, they can't take time off. I think most people could take sabbaticals. I don't think most people would want to take it for years, but a yeah. few weeks or a few months, I think is doable for most people. Like if you're thinking of leaving a company, you could take three months off. I would save for a much like I would save for a house or something like that. It's definitely a planning process that you need to think ahead around. And the reality is, you know, you're always going to leave something on the table for sure as it relates to money or your career. Like those forces are for everybody going to be very strong. And so people might be listening and be like, oh, it's night, you know, both of you guys, you know, had an opportunity to exit and so on. But you, we both left a lot on the table and you need to at some point say no, like you, you need, at some point you need to say, Hey, this is enough. And I need a clean break. And I do think it's more accessible than people think if they plan for it and, and budget for it as they would a house, a car, uh, a vacation, you know, and so on. Yeah. What, what advice would you give someone that wanted to take a sabbatical? What would you say to them if they're like in their twenties or thirties or even their forties had to just give them advice of how to get a high level, how to do it. And like, what yeah. you, they should focus on when they go on a sabbatical. I think that, you know, what I've really tried to recommend to people is assume that it's going to take at least twice as long as you think, and then it's going to, you're going to want twice as much money from that as you think. And so, you know, starting with the time. I think like we've said, you know, there is a process of just getting into a sabbatical that takes a lot of time and just unwinding from your prior experience and just stop just slowing down your brain, right? And most people like myself, I mean, for my honeymoon, I took two weeks off and that was the longest vacation I had taken in, you know, 12 years in the time of my startup. And, um, it's, it's not enough time really to get into it. If you're thinking, hey, I want three months off, plan for six. Or you, you want six, plan for 12. And then I recommend to double your savings. So if it's, you know, six months, plan for 12 months of runway. You know, if it's 12 months, plan for 24 months. Because I think like we're talking about, if you have the pressure of money sort of breathing down your neck, at least for me, it would have been a very different experience. You know, I'm lucky enough to have some financial security where I can take my time and really think through how I go about my next steps. But if it was, you know, I've got a young family, I got to support my family, I got to, you know, do this and that, right? That time pressure is going to act like a, a countdown, in, mm -hmm. you know, in your mind. For me, I, you know, the other part about a sabbatical is that I really have trouble being unproductive or just wasting a day. And, you know, when you waste a day, you're like, oh man, I, I just lost that day. It'll never come back. You know, I can't afford that many of these type of days again. And, th and then the prop, you know, you relapse and you get back on the productivity drug and you're like, okay, well, let me start working on this project again. I just think that time freedom it is important. And so I think that's like the planning of the sabbatical. Now in the sabbatical, I think it comes down to what you said, which is try and disconnect from the start. And then you can sort of re-emerge after you've had some of that time away, but without some sufficient disconnect from the beginning, I think you're going to get into the problems that we had. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree with a lot of that. If I were in my twenties and I was single, I think I would travel or something like go to Asia. Right. And then while I was there, I would probably park myself in a city. So just to get into routine and then start reflecting. Yeah. I don't think I have any very specific advice I have how to do that other than journaling or whatever the process is for you. I think it's going to be different for you. And it's kind of like the creative process. There is some structure, but it's going to be pretty chaotic. Yeah. And Go then I, I would give myself a deadline, which is if I had six months of savings or if I want to do for six months, I would have 12 months of savings. But at that six month mark, it's 
kind of emerging with some direction and then maybe yeah. spending the next six months like pursuing that. Because what a lot of people don't realize is if you only have six months of savings after that, once you get to that three month mark, you're probably going to start looking for a job because you don't want yep. that budget to go to zero. That's yep. probably how I would do it. I was going to ask you this somewhat tangential, but I've been thinking about it a lot because pretty much everyone in their 20s always asked me for my opinion on this. They would say, hey, Rick, you worked at Privy Health for 12 years. They went public. Great. Would you recommend that I do that too? Would you recommend that I work really yeah. hard for 10 years, 15 years, when I get to my mid to late 30s? Because this is literally the question I get all the time for anyone that's 25. It's like, I want to retire by the time I'm 35. Would you recommend that I work really hard <laughs> and start a company or work at a high growth startup and then retire after that. There is no easy answer. There is no one answer. I mean, okay, Let, let's imagine I recommend in my past. I think you should join an early stage startup, survive the ups and downs of the product and product market fit and new leadership coming in and out and you know, new CEO joining and you're going to last 12 years. It's going to become a public company and it's going to become a very large public company. And you're going to have enough equity remaining after serious dilution along the way, you know, for this to all have been worth it. Like, I can't recommend that to anybody. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, don't do it. Don't do what I did. I do think though, there are some rules around if your goal is to retire early or make a lot of money early, there are rules, which is in my language, I talk about leverage. You've got to have some sort of leverage, whether it be startups have leverage in terms of the scale that they can create in terms of one input becomes significant scalability of a product or solution. You've got to have leverage of ownership, right? Where if you're the primary owner or serious owner of some sort of uh, company, or maybe you have leverage in terms of a sophisticated expertise that is valued in the market. And so you can command a high price for those things. Without leverage, you're just hoping for luck. You're just, you know, man, I hope I, you know, just with a lottery here. And I, even with some of those things, it, it is still really hard, but I think you've got to have some sort of mechanism by which you're going to make that money. But I don't know, man. I don't know if I can really suitably recommend the startup. I actually also caution away from doing it. And then I say, okay, if you still want to do it, then it might be okay for you, right? If you know yeah. how horrible it's going to be and awful and bad and so on, and you hear that and you say, I still have to start a company or do a startup, right? Like, go for it, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. you might as well, you know, you might as well try it out, right? Yeah. People that want to start a company, they're going to start a company. It's probably relative to the scale of what they want to accomplish. But I would definitely come in with some guardrails. I think if the goal is to retire early. It'll be very difficult to get there without owning some type of equity in something that compounds over time. And I always tell people that the number they think they need to retire is probably much lower, especially if you're not spending your money on materialistic things that maybe show off like it's like a status symbol. So cost of living yes. could be pretty low for most people. I really believe that, you know, people should sort of try and get to some form of autonomy and freedom as fast as possible. Oh, yeah. That you is know, great whether that advice. Is, that is great advice. Whether it's a, I mean, you could call it lean fire or, or whatever, but just, you know, if you're right in the extreme of living paycheck to paycheck or in debt, you have no autonomy. You have no choices. Your back's against the wall. You have a you know, terrible boss or a terrible situation. You have no autonomy. Now, the more you're able to sort of create some cushion in your life is even midlife, if around 40, you've got young kids, but you've built up some savings like we're talking about. You can kind of say, I want to like take my freedom now versus like, you know, working 10 more years and then I'll have freedom when I'm 50 as an example. 
and just, I think getting to that place of autonomy, I think as fast as possible, gives you some optionality in terms of like how you want to live your life. Yeah. And how you want to spend your time too. I think, yep. I think I read that Charlie Munger said that getting to your first hundred K is really hard, but it's yeah, critical right. for investing. Yep. I'd probably say that's probably true for just like figuring out what you want to do is like, yeah. Just figuring out whatever your numbers get to there as quickly as possible when you're hungry and you have ambition and then reassess from there. But yeah, going back to ambition, I know you've written a lot about this, so I want to touch on that and hard work and how all this stuff intersects. But yeah, how has like your thoughts and ambition shifted since your sabbatical? Yeah. You know, so my old ambition was like, I was going to become Steve Jobs. It's yeah. kind of ridiculous to say things like that. I'm embarrassed saying it out loud, <laughs> but just like rid ridiculous stuff like that. I'm going to be this elite, you know, business yeah. guy, entrepreneur, so on, right? That's my old ambition. I was so hungry and it worked. I mean, honestly, it's like that strong work identity. And then when I took some time off as I was going through these things, I started to like, man, am I losing my edge? Like, am I... Have I lost my ambition? It just feels like I don't have that same craving, that fire in the belly that got me here. And, you know, yeah, like, man, wh like, where am I going to go if, like, I don't have that fire to drive me? And, you know, where I kind of concluded is when I started thinking about ambition is, it was, wait a minute. I actually am ambitious. It's just not about the old stuff. And the, I kind of frame it as this sort of basic, you know, basic ambition, which is, you know, really whatever you think of, like the ambition that you're handed with. And a lot of this for a lot of people, it's career and success and things like that. You know, acknowledging that, hey, that ambition made sense for that time, but I'm in a new place now. I don't have that same ambition for work success as I used to. I don't have that same part in the belly, but I have ambition to be a great father. I want to be a fantastic father to my kids, A plus, you know, the best father to them that I can. I want to be a better citizen in my community. I want to exercise creative pursuits and learn some new creative skills that I can get better at. I want to have ambition for living a long and healthy life. And I've sort of reframed this going from basic ambition to broad ambition to say, now, wait a minute, I didn't lose my ambition. It just evolved and maybe it got broader. Maybe the old ambition was just a very narrow slice of one part of my life that I was maximizing and optimizing. And now I've just sort of picked my head up to say, wait a minute, there's more to life than just this one slice. And so that's how I'm thinking about it nowadays. Do you think there is a potential for a trap to take like whatever the ambition was for work and apply it to some of these other pillars? I think I was chatting with someone sure. that they noticed that there was a tendency for people to work really hard in tech, in SF. They get tired of it or they want something else, they move it towards spirituality and then they take that same ambition, they apply it to that where it might be a little unhealthy, it might be a little statusy, it might be just replacing that work bucket now with spirituality where they try to become the most spiritual person on the planet. Yeah. Do you think there's a potential for a trap there to just take the same thing and replace it with another thing? It's such a good insight. I mean, you know, take Brian Johnson, right? The longevity yeah. guy, like is a, you know, God bless him for being a guinea pig, but it's like a, he transferred yeah. his like a single ambition from one lane to another, you know, and, you know, people trying to get famous, you know, on the internet or, or yeah, something yeah. like that, right? Like you're just trading one thing for the other. And that's where I just think, the ambition that I'm talking about is a lot more multidimensional. It's, to me, it's more human. There are points when you go into something, but you say, hey, that's enough. I, I did good enough there, right? Like health, okay, I'm exercising, I'm working on my diet. I'm, you know, not taking all these 
supplements or something like that. But I'm not going to like just give my life up to mm -hmm. add a couple of years to my life, even though that's actually a really good thing, right, on its surface, right? But going too far sort of creates these trade-offs where you give up so much more. And that's where I just think, you know, I think the market rewards these sort of obsessions into mm -hmm. singular lenses, you know, where, you know, you want the best or the most extreme or, you know, you look at the Elon Musk, the Michael Jordans of the world, the Brian Johnson, of the world, like the people who just like grew everything else. I'm just going to do this one thing really well. Like that tends to be our idols in our culture. And, you know, my idols are actually a lot more like balanced people who, you know, they work, but they can step away from work and be a great father. They can have fun. <laughs> they can, you know, have different hobbies and so on. And, and so I think that to me right now, that balancing out, smoothing out is important. Got it. You've also written about scaling down after scaling up. So I think I would describe that as, you know, this high growth career, high growth startup. What we did was massive scale, reaching millions of people or hundreds, whatever the number yep. is. Yeah. What led you to think through the concept of scaling down and what does that mean and how has that manifested? Yeah, I mean, I think this is just like, a, you know, ambition, hard work, productivity. All these words are things that, you know, I and probably many others take as a given in terms of, hey, these are virtues. These are like good things. And, you know, gosh, I mean, I just like some article just popped up, like how I scaled my company to a hundred million or something like that. The whole tech world is obsessed with scale and how do you scale all that stuff. And it the scale benefited me, no doubt. I mean, you know, I was part of a company that helped millions of patients in healthcare, right? No less. But the problem with scale is the disconnect that it can create. Because scaling is really about one thing, one person, one input being stretched across more. And by definition, you become disconnected many times with the thing that you're working on or what you're trying to impact or the people you're impacting. You know, for me, it's not just about helping you know, one patient who I meet and can see and picture and see how I improve their lives. Instead, it's a number on a spreadsheet, right? It's some pixels mm -hmm. on a screen. Or scale manifests itself in terms of, hey, I was able to grow my career from a entry level, associate level to senior vice president with hundreds of people in my organization and so on. Well, in part of that role, I then have VPs under me and directors and managers and associates and there's all these layers, you know, to an organization disconnecting me from, you know, the end real work, right? Because as a leader as of an organization, maybe at the beginning you're doing the real work, but then over time it becomes about how do you, how do your teams do the real work? How do you mm -hmm. enable the organization to be successful? And so it just, we've incorporated so much scale into our lives that, you know, at least for me, I got disconnected from things that brought me meaning, from connecting with the people I was helping, from doing the real work. The real thing is that, like, I connect with and, you know, helps people. And so, you know, that's where I kind of bring in this concept of scale down after you scale up, which is sort of, okay, you, you can go and grow and have these big careers, but how do you reconnect with what's real in the world? Like, how do you get plugged back into real life? You know, and for me, it was instead of helping a million people, how can I help one person? Like I started mentoring one individual and can I help this one person improve their life, right? How can I really just focus on improving my family and then going out from there around the community? And, you know, instead of like scale, national scale, world, global scale, how do I connect back down? And that's usually where the good stuff is. People don't find meeting by being abstracted through 
a dozen different layers away from what they're impacting working on. At least that was my experience. And other people have shared that resonates with them as well. So yeah. this reminds me of something you wrote about meaning is the highest form of wealth. Yeah. Which is a counter to what most people would say, which is like time and freedom and flexibility right. is also, you know, the benefits of having wealth. What did you mean by writing that? Yeah, I think that when you don't have enough money, you think money is wealth. And then when you start to have money, you start to realize, well, I don't have any freedom, right? <laughs> I, have, yeah. I have these businesses and these titles and I have all these things, but I don't really have time. But you will hear, and there's Morgan Housel and so on. The greatest form of wealth is freedom. And that's how you should spend your wealth is to create time, which is very valuable. We are talking about how it can unlock so much for you. But you realize that these are just stepping stones along the way. Because what do you have when you have freedom? You, okay, you know, you just have time. You just have openness. And, you know, people will say, I'll just do what I want. Well, what do you want? <laughs> and, you know, what brings fulfillment to your day, purpose to, that, to your day? Because, you know, we can talk about sort of having sort of pointless, unproductive fun, but also... There are times when that gets to be too much and you sort of say, hey, like, I need to reconnect. I, I have something to give here. You know, who do I matter to in this world? And that's where I just think that meaning is the highest form of wealth. And even if you don't have any money, Gandhi and the Mother Teresa's of the world, like, they are living extremely rich, full lives that probably many of us can't even comprehend. For me, it's about how do I maximize that meaning in my life right now? The things that really, you know, it's not just, it's just, just fun, but it just, it brings that sort of deep sense of fulfillment on another level. So what is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it really comes down to, for me right now, family is a big source of, of meaning, right? Being a father you know, and, you know, being mattering to them on a day-to-day -day basis. Writing is a very right. meaningful activity to me. The act of writing in itself, whether anyone likes my writing or not is a different question. But the act of writing, when I sit down with my coffee every morning and I sit down and I get thoughts out of my head and I put it out on paper and I I feel like I write it in a clever way or what the best version that I can do, I find that to be meaningful. And then I find when that sort of activity can translate to helping people. And when I hear, you know, people tell me, hey, what you said really resonated with me. I'm going through this and this in my career and that really helped reframe the problem for me. Like that sort of combination of Doing what I like to do and helping people is like the perfect cocktail Got of things to bring meaning for me. Got it. Yeah, it seems like it's just a recurring theme behind a lot of things that you're already doing and being content with the things that bring you fulfillment or joy or happiness or whatever adjective or word you want to yeah. put there one thing i've been thinking about is people should be maximizing their tam not total addressable market but their total addressable meaning you know what if we were to like backcast from what would be the most meaningful life possible where it's just firing on all cylinders and it's enriching, fulfilling, and when you breathe your last breath, you said, man, that was a good damn life, right? That casting from there to say, all right, like, what are those spaces of meaning in my life? And for each person, it might be different, but like I was saying, family, having a vocation or activity that you do on a daily basis and you want to keep doing. 
you find a group of people that you want to help and it brings you meaning to help those people, a cause that you believe in and you really think that, you know, you can help people and, and change, you know, things like, man, if I were to fill that out in the same way as an entrepreneur trying to identify their TAM and maximize that TAM and, you know, or capture the TAM, like, you know, maybe we should be thinking about or total addressable meaning. Yeah. Do you think you'll ever start a company or go back into what you did before? Do you, you think you'll ever go down that path again? I mean, I, I'm yeah. definitely keeping the option open. I'm not sort of in this position where I'm just like, screw this old experiences, skills, connections, you know, industry, and you know, go mm -hmm. screw yourself. Like. I'm out of here. I'm never coming back. Right. I don't think burning those bridges is a smart idea for anybody, but you know, I really don't hold that back. And the way here's like a way I would put it to him, like, is like the old B in terms of figuring out what to be doing would have sort of tried to, you know, figure out an opportunity, analyze the opportunity you know, determine how it's going to be successful. What's the path to that success? All right, let's create plans. It's going to be this multi-step plan to get there and build up to it. What I'm doing now is not at all that. It's emerging. It's, I am going to focus on spending my time doing the things that really bring me the most meaning on a day to basis and see where that takes me. So. Maybe one year from now, I want to keep writing and I want to turn that into a book, you know, sort of just accelerating that path. Maybe after a year of writing, I'm like, man, I've written everything that I want to say, <laughs> like, or I'm getting sick of writing, you know, and I want to start a company in this domain that I'm in now. Maybe it's a small thing. Maybe it's a nonprofit thing. Maybe it's a VC back thing. I don't know. Or maybe I just say, hey, you know what? I really liked healthcare a lot and I feel like I have more to give there and I want to return back. I'm not trying to project where I'm going to be in one year, five years, 10 years. And I'm trying to stop myself from doing that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it's just following your journey, your curiosity, see where it leads and kind of pulling whatever threads that you find interesting at that time. But it's hard. I mean, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, you know, you ran a business. I, I was an operator. And so like, you know, we're going to have goals. We're going to have process and metrics and plans. And this is how we know we're going to be successful. We're going to have a budget. And stuff, blah, blah, blah. Like that was my thing. Like, I, I mean, that when people, when I explain to people, hey, I'm going through on this kind of emergent path. We'll see where it's taking it. They're like, what is wrong with you, dude? Like, like, where is Rick? Because you've gone off the deep end here, man. But so I get it. <laughs> like, I get it. It's a different, it's a different way of thinking. Yeah. To wrap up for someone that is feeling stuck in their career, especially if they're working in like a high growth career or just feeling stuck with work, what advice yeah. would you give to them if they wanted to come to some similar realizations as you, like what advice would you give them around either scaling down or re redefining success or their identity yeah. or like what advice would you give them to create this fulfilling life that, that you mentioned and take the first steps to get there? There's kind of maybe like two angles here. One is the, you know, what we were talking about, the sabbatical mm -hmm. angle. Find a way where you can really disconnect, take time off. You know, it might require you to save for the next, you know, few years in order to get there. It's, it's not easy. And so, you know, start to plan your escape and find ways to create freedom. And usually a lot of that comes down to like, how do you... You know, cut down your expenses. Like, what are ways in which you can create a little bit of more margin so that you do have that flexibility to take that time away? So that's one. The other way is, right, how can you move to the spaces of meaning right now? 
And I would argue for a lot of people that I know in the kind of high growth tech ish, high work identity space, don't look to work for those sources of meaning. How can you find sources of meaning outside of work? Like a community project, your family, some sort of creative pursuit, like start testing those ideas on the side. Now, whatever you think, maybe it's based off of your past, something you always wanted to do, just try and find a slice. Cause I think a lot of people are trying to force through like, how do I create meaning? I want to have a, like this perfect calling of a career and they're trying to force it. And I don't think you can force this stuff. I mean, God bless all these people who, you know, their calling is to be a doctor and that profession is available and there for them and they continue to find it. But, you know, like a lot of people don't have that and they're trying to force it through their work. And I think it leads to a lot more frustration and emptiness and they're on social media and they're listening to Mike and Rick talk about how great their lives are, whatever, like, you know, God damn it, I want that life. Y you know. To go through at least what I went through, it, it's returning to those like very simplistic, basic, tangible sources that then you kind of build your way back up. And, you know, I think a lot of people are just disconnected from their, you know, what gives them me today. So that would be my advice no, I think that's, for me to say. I think that's really good advice. I, I wish I heard that maybe a decade or two ago. I actually think people should do both. Yeah. So on the first, if you're saving for a sabbatical, I wouldn't wait to go on a sabbatical to figure all this stuff out. I think you yeah. can start experimenting with your life now. If you look at your identity as a portfolio, if 100% is in work, maybe you just drop it to 80. Yeah. You fill the other 20% with, I don't know, anything else that you want to explore. And if you're not into it, then you could just shut it off and explore something right. else. But there's always this perception that if you're like so focused on work, you're working hundred percent of the time, hundred hours a week. That's just not true. You know, people go to the gym, yeah. they go out to eat with their friends, they go on vacations, unless you're like Elon yeah. Musk, who I still think takes breaks. It's just yeah. not true that even if you're working hard, you're working hundred percent of your time on that stuff, you know? Yeah. So I think exploring other interests and kind of start diversifying that, I guess, portfolio of your identity. And I think you'll start finding meaning or purpose in and a bunch of other areas. Some of it might be helping others. Some of it might just be helping yourself mm -hmm. and just kind of then building that well-rounded, well-balanced um, outlook. But I, I would definitely do both. I wouldn't just wait. You know, I think a lot of people think that if this thing happens in the future, it's going to solve all their problems. And I think your advice is really good, which is you could start now. And even if you don't want to take a sabbatical, you could start now. So that's, yeah. that would be... Uh, similar advice I would give to anyone that's in this situation as well. Yep. No, it, it's, it's hard. I think that, you know, a lot of people struggle right now. I think that people, especially in our age group, I know we didn't talk about midlife as much, but I think people right now have built up some bit of their career. They worked really hard over the last 15, 20 years. May, they have a family that they want to support, but also be there for. Their health is declining, you know, their back's starting to hurt and, you know, their dreams are disappearing and like, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just a very acute period. And so, you know, use the crisis, you know, to reevaluate, you know, what's right for you. Yeah. I mean, we didn't touch upon that, but that is such a great topic. I mean, if I had to give someone unsolicited advice, I would say the first thing they should focus on is their health and fitness, yep. like take yep. care of yourself start going to the gym, start working out, start eating healthier. But I would probably just pick one thing and just start there. I mean, if I don't get a good night of sleep, like the whole next day is terrible. Like, I mean, and I, you know, that's when the, you know, oh, what am I doing with my life? And, you know, should I, like, what am I doing trying to become a writer and stuff and all that, you know, all that BS starts to fill my head. And then, you know, I have a good night of sleep and I'm like, oh, I'm actually good. I'm <laughs> like, I'm doing the right thing here. All right. The last question I have, which is tied to the midlife. Yeah. Do you notice that a lot of people want to just hit the blow up button for their career? I, yep. I've seen a lot, so many people are so successful in what they're doing, 10, 15, 20. They get to their 
as they get to their 40s, I see them getting very excited about clicking the button. And I would describe the button as <laughs> blow everything up and I want to go do something completely different. What, yep. why, why, why do you think that is? And what advice would you give to those people? Oh, man. That's a few question. You know, everyone's into the apocalypse too. I think there's something like to that. of just like we return to the, uh, our base instincts. I, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of what we're saying. They're over indexed some yes, particular realm of their life. And they've been over indexing for a long time. And it's kind of like a overweight person that you know, this is just not the last few weeks here. You have years and years of habits that have accumulated and built upon themselves to get here. And so there's a feeling that, man, I like, I've gone so far in the wrong direction. The only option is to, to hit the explode button mm -hmm. versus peeling that back you know, over time you know, it just sounds a lot harder, right? <laughs> and that's why I do think things like sabbaticals can be shortcuts to it, which give you the space and time to evaluate these things. But it's all, you know, get ready because all of those emotions, the doubts, insecurities are going to be accelerated forward for you. I mean, I don't know what you think, but like, that's what I, I think I accelerated my midlife crisis by like bringing all of these concerns and thoughts about my life just like straight into focus. And so, you know, be careful of the ex explode button because it's, it's, we're talking retrospectively about these pains yeah. and insecurities, right? Like you should have caught me a year ago. You know, we wouldn't be doing a podcast about, you know, lessons no. learned here. Anyways. Yeah, I love your point around over indexing. So if you think about like as a, a portfolio or identity portfolio, like a stock portfolio, maybe you put all of your chips in the work bucket and what you thought the ROI on that would have been maybe financial security or status or external validation. Noticing a lot of people as they get older realize that those things don't matter as much or when they did get it, they still had this void and their natural inclination was to just hit the reset button. I think maybe a better approach is to rebalance your portfolio and maybe take it from 100 to 80 or 50 or figure out what that rebalancing act would be and then hit that button to rebalance your portfolio. Yeah. We're not saying get out of stocks completely. We're just yeah. saying your portfolio over the last like 10, 20 years has just become primarily stocks. It's leaving you in a fragile position that, yeah. You know, leading me to identity crisis. <laughs> well, Rick, this has been a great conversation. I, I can definitely relate to a lot of what you wrote and I'm excited to share this episode with people because this is a topic that a lot of people are pondering now. I don't know if it's because we're going through it ourselves and we are a magnet where a lot of people that are going through it are hitting us up or if this is just something that's happened more on a macro level, I don't know. But I do think <laughs> it's gonna help a lot of people think through and hopefully they can walk away with one or two good insights or a good piece of advice that can help them on their journey. So definitely thank you. Where can people find you online and read some of your writing? Yeah, the easiest way to find me is just thewayofwork.com. And I'm writing there. And that's really where the, the best thoughts come in. Thanks, thank Mike. It was fun. Yeah, likewise.